In an age of increased dependence on the technologically sophisticated critical infrastructure that sustains modern life, it becomes ever more important for you to have a plan of action to deal with local, regional, and national disasters, which are only projected to escalate in the coming years. Today's video will be a comprehensive guide on how to start prepping. Let's get to it. As much as there's a lot of attention given to the negative things in our world, we are living in an age of incredible prosperity and opportunity. But if history is any predictor of the future, we can anticipate an economic slowdown, the bubble bursting, and subsequent socio-political unrest. And that's probably only the beginning. As extreme weather events, cybersecurity threats, super bugs, and global tensions between superpowers escalate, it's all the more justification for every single person to have an emergency preparedness plan. The first step to becoming a prepper is acknowledging the extent of your domestication and realizing how vulnerable you would be to the forces of nature if it weren't for the critical infrastructure supporting our society. The next part is making a plan of action. The problem is, not everybody has the time to master the art form of living off the grid. Learning skills like advanced medical care, wilderness survival, security training, gardening, hunting, and even amateur radio and off-grid communications. But if you can in the very least start with a 72-hour kit, you're in a much better position than most people. From that foundation, you can begin to develop more advanced preparedness skills. Although the info in this video is universally applicable no matter where you live, it's up to you to be pragmatic about your prepping and tailor your strategy to managing the most high-risk potential disasters within the region that you're in. So for example, if you live in the desert, having 10 different ways to purify water is fine, but if you don't have any stored or a way to collect it, you're pretty much SOL. Or for instance, if you live in a northern climate, 6 months out of the year it's going to be cold, and your prepping gear should reflect that. Some variables that might influence your preparedness strategy are things like population density, high-risk weather events, the climate of the region that you're in, the socioeconomics and politics of where you live, the availability of public-use land areas, as well as natural resource availability, things such as water and wild edibles. Do you live near a military installation? Do you live near a nuclear power plant? Do you live in a region that's prone to wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, brush fires, dust storms, ice storms, hail storms? Having an awareness of what you're prepping for will save you a lot of time and make your strategy far more surgical and effective. Being prepared for a full-blown end-of-the-world Mad Max scenario is great and all, but this is beyond the immediate means of most people. To help guide you in your journey in becoming a more prepared and self-responsible citizen, we'll be using this prepping pyramid that I created, which is modeled after Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This will provide a framework for prioritizing your preparedness goals. Let's get into it. How the prepping pyramid works is that the most fundamental prepping priorities are on the bottom, and your goals will become increasingly more advanced as you move up the pyramid. The first focus of preparedness should be your temple, that is, your body. There's an old saying that the body is the temple of the soul, and it's what you are trying to keep alive. Certain survival situations may require you to travel on foot for long distances, defend yourself and your loved ones from an attacker, or carry large amounts of weight or people out of disaster zones under very stressful conditions. This will require physical health to the best of your capability, including strength, agility, speed, and stamina. You can have all the gear and skills in the world, and if you can't haul ass to get out of Dodge when the time comes, none of that is going to matter. There is no sense prepping if you are statistically more likely to die of natural causes before SHTF due to poor lifestyle choices. Spending thousands of dollars on prepping supplies and being physically unhealthy makes no sense whatsoever. Now there are many predispositions and chronic conditions that people have which are outside of their control, but there are always better life choices you can make to slow those things from progressing. Now you don't need to be an athlete, but you should aspire to be in as reasonable physical condition as possible no matter what your age or physical handicaps. Strength training, martial arts, and cardiovascular exercise are the number one forms of training as it pertains to preparedness. Check out my Mad Max workout video which provides you with a comprehensive workout plan which consists of several compound movements which are functional and translate well into real world activities. Other things you'll want to do is if you have work that needs to be done like surgeries or dentistry, if at all possible, don't procrastinate that. Get that work done while we have a functioning power grid and a relatively stable economy, because the opportunity to get it done may not always exist. 
Now, if you require medication to manage a chronic illness, a prudent prepper would stockpile as much of that as possible because once again, those medications may be hard to come by after disaster strikes. Also, if you require corrective eyewear, make sure you have a couple, if not several, backup pairs of glasses. Don't be stuck out there blind as a bat after it hits the fan. The next step of the pyramid is your survival tools. This is perhaps one of the most daunting areas for people to explore, and even more daunting for me to fully have to cover in this video. You will find many links in the description which go into far greater detail about this subcategory, but I'll do my best to summarize. One of the best pieces of advice I can give is to invest in the proper tools from the start and then master them. Don't complicate your life by buying 10 different things that do the same function. Get high quality gear from the start that covers your bases, get familiar with it, and master it. Now this doesn't mean you should run out in a panic and accrue credit card debt in an urgent attempt to prepare for the worst of what the future might have to offer. Be sensible with your spending and give yourself the time you need to get your bases covered. You've waited this long to start prepping, a few extra months isn't gonna hurt. As long as you're moving in the direction of becoming more prepared, that's better off than you were before. Now there are three general classes of tools as they pertain to preparedness. Micro, meso, and macro tools. Micro tools are essentially bug out tools. They are small, lightweight, portable, and are there to get you through short term survival scenarios. Meso tools are medium sized tools. These are primarily for the purpose of bugging in and riding out a short to mid term disaster. These are larger items which are meant for stationary use and better replicate the standard of living that you're accustomed to. Then there are macro tools. These are much larger tools which are built for long range, long term survival situations in grid down predicaments of six months and beyond. Micro tools are built for foraging and scavenging. Meso preparedness is built for living off the energy that you've stored. And macro preparedness is all about regeneration, growing your own food and harvesting your own energy. Let's use water purification for an example of how it fits in here. The micro version of water purification would be something like the Aquamira Frontier Pro portable water filtration system. The meso version might be something like the Berkey water filter. The macro version of water procurement might include something like a rain catchment system. This will allow you to collect an indefinite amount of water. The macro level requires the biggest commitment of time and resources, and this likely wouldn't be possible if you are a tenant in an apartment building. Which type of prepping you start with really depends on where you live. If you live in the city, you're definitely going to want to start on the level of micro preparedness. If you live on an acreage, it would probably make more sense to start on the level of macro, but starting on the level of micro preparedness is an excellent learning curve and an affordable process to familiarize yourself with the fundamentals of survival. I recommend people start working on a bug out bag and scale up from there. The bug out bag is basically a scaled down version of everything you're going to need from a meso and macro perspective. Its purpose is to assist you in evacuating a dangerous situation and should be able to keep you alive upwards of 72 hours. Here are some of the primary things you need to survive. Food, water, shelter, heating and cooling, depending on the season and your location, lighting, medical supplies, personal protective equipment, and radio equipment. After that, I would progress into home food storage, home fortifications, and if you live in a winter climate, absolutely one of the most important things to do is find a way to heat your home. The more advanced preparedness products like Geiger counters, gas masks, and hazmat suits, those are built for lower probability events, and as such, they can wait till after you have your basics covered. In the last 10 minutes of this video, I go over specific product recommendations. I initially put that segment in right here, but I realized it really interrupted with the flow of the video. If it's of interest to you, stick around for the latter half of the video. Moving up the preparedness pyramid, we move into the level of territory. This section is all about your territory, where you're going to live, where you're gonna bug out to, and how you're going to shelter and protect yourself once you get there. One of the first things you should do when planning for territory is get good maps of your local area and nearby wilderness areas. Find detailed topographical maps online or in store. I find that the back road map books are a great addition to your kit. They are highly detailed and very accurate. If you live in Canada, I would advise you to get a Crown Land resource map. These are usually available online and I'm sure there is a US equivalent. 
These maps provide detailed info about resources that you won't typically find on most maps. They can be very useful for hunting purposes. I would advise not relying on GPS, because even if you have a way to recharge your devices, in the case of a serious long-term disaster, if GPS satellites are not regularly calibrated by ground-based relay systems, they will become useless in a matter of weeks. So while having offline map apps on your phone makes practical sense, combine these with paper versions for good measure. Next thing you should focus on is having an evacuation plan, which will include a destination and a means of transportation to get there. This should also include a rendezvous point if you get disconnected from family members and you don't have a means to communicate. This may mean having a set bug out location. For some people, this might just be public wilderness use areas. For others, it may be a cabin in the woods. But you should have some safe place to retreat to if you live in the cities. In the case of a regional disaster, a bug out location may just amount to getting a hotel in another state. But if you are evacuating from a very densely populated region, there is a possibility that there wouldn't be any vacancies. In the case of a full-blown national grid down situation, which might be triggered by a widespread cyber attack, electromagnetic pulse, or even a nuclear disaster, there's a lot of debate around whether or not the city is safer than the countryside. Some military strategists with experience in real combat zones have indicated that while exiting an urban environment might remove you from the initial riots and chaos that might ensue, if you retreat to an isolated location, you lose the protection of safety in numbers, and you may in fact be a more likely target of a rogue group of marauding criminals who would have the advantage of nobody coming to your assistance. As such, this might only be a strategic option for large groups which have trained security personnel. The next thing you would want to do is prepare your home. One of the best things you can do for your home is ensure that you have good door locks, ensure that you're using three inch nails in the strike plate. This simple fix will make it much more difficult for somebody to kick in your door and get a decent home surveillance system. These are not that expensive nowadays. For the price of a new smartphone, you can have a top of the line home surveillance system, which will bring you a lot of peace of mind and deter criminals. Keep several fire extinguishers in your home and have a fire escape plan. Now I've only scratched the surface of home fortifications in this video. I would encourage you to check out those links below for more information because I have gone into great depth about this issue in other videos. The next level of the pyramid is training, thinking and skill building. The only reason why this is lower priority on this pyramid is because the reality is most people aren't going to get here. Most people are going to stop at 72 hour emergency preparedness. For those who press on and want to learn more about self-reliance, enhancing your skills is an absolute must. As the saying goes, knowledge weighs nothing. This might include taking courses on first aid, self-defense, amateur radio, wilderness survival, or gardening, hunting, and animal processing. It's at this level that you start to develop the skills that will allow you to survive even if you don't have the tools and capabilities provided by the lower sections of the pyramid. Up next is toughness, temperament, and temperance. After you've begun to develop new preparedness skills and knowledge, it's important to continue working on your own character so you'll be emotionally stable enough to apply those skills when the time comes. Challenge yourself regularly to get out of your comfort zone. Learn to manage your emotions and anxiety in stressful situations using meditation, self-help, and motivational videos. There are more advanced forms of stress inoculation training which are well simulated in the combative arts. These activities will condition you to keep your cool while under extreme amounts of stress. And with regards to temperance, you should probably abstain from the overconsumption of drugs and alcohol or doing any activity excessively. Not only are these going to drain you physically, mentally and emotionally, using substances will increase the likelihood that you're going to be in dangerous situations. The next level of the pyramid is your team. There may come a point when you desire to connect with like-minded people because after all, if you're planning on surviving long term, you'll benefit from having the company of as many skilled people as possible. Check out my video entitled Top 10 Occupations After Grid Down, where I talk about the importance of a diversity of specialized skill sets. Last, but certainly not least, and some people might even put this first. This is the level I call theory. Some people might call it the theological level. In times of disaster where the rule of law is not being enforced, it's important that you have a strong moral compass. The time may come when you have to make ethical decisions which impact your own and other people's lives. 
because of its abstract and philosophical nature, I situate this one on top of the pyramid. Not in the sense that it is the least important, but in many respects it's the one that oversees all of our actions in our day-to-day -day lives. I hope that you found some of the information in this video useful. This video was intended to be a cursory guide to help you start prepping. There are dozens of links in the description that complement this discussion. Now my last word of caution would be that there's always a sense of urgency when people get into preparedness because it can be quite shocking when people have the realization of how vulnerable they actually would be. The tendency is to rush out and buy a bunch of gear as fast as possible. While I do believe that prepping should be a priority in the face of our general complacency as a society when it comes to this issue, it doesn't have to come at the expense of getting ahead of yourself. Start out by working on an emergency food and water supply in a bug out bag and branch out from there. If your journey into becoming prepared takes six months or even a year, it's not the end of the world. Something is always going to be better than nothing. For water storage, there are collapsible water cubes, 50 gallon drums paired with a Berkey water filtration system. Water bobs are very cheap and cost effective, especially if you live in an apartment building, it allows you to store water in your bathtub or pool shock, also known as calcium hypochlorite. You can use pool shock to make bleach, and you can use bleach to purify water. This is probably the cheapest chemical option when it comes to treating water. I would advise against storing actual bleach for this purpose. It only has an effective shelf life of six to 12 months, whereas calcium hypochlorite can theoretically last for years. Just be careful when handling this substance. Use an N99 mask, protective eyewear, and latex gloves. There's also the MSR SE200. This device allows you to turn any salt and water mixture into chlorine bleach, essentially giving you an unlimited supply of chemical water purification. With regards to food storage, MREs and freeze-dried food for portability and long shelf life, you can extend the shelf life of staple grains like rice and flour by using mylar bags, oxygen absorbers, and five gallon buckets. This is the most cost-effective way to store months worth of food on a small budget of one to two hundred dollars. See links in the description for more information. For short-range communications, your standard FRS or GMRS walkie-talkies will suffice. I'm currently using the Motorola Talkabouts because they do have USB recharging. For longer range, higher powered options, ham radio systems like the Baofeng radio. Another product gaining a lot of attention is the Gotenna mesh system. This allows you to create a network whereby every user who has a mesh Gotenna device acts as a relay connecting users together. So you could theoretically create very large networks using the Gotenna mesh system across a large area. This will function independent of the grid. A radio that has weather band, FM, AM, and even shortwave for long range signal receiving would be very useful in an emergency situation as this would allow you to get information outside your locale. The Kato 500L is a great option. In terms of self-defense, it really depends on the laws of the country, province, or state that you live in. So I'm not going to provide any recommendations here. All I would say is maximize your capability to the fullest extent of the law. In terms of shelter, an emergency bivy sack, a heavy duty emergency blanket. In terms of sleeping, if you want something that's gonna last forever, get a wool blanket. If you want something which is going to be ultra light, but incredibly warm, get a goose down sleeping bag. I would also recommend some sort of sleeping mat or cot. There are numerous options on the market nowadays. Thermarest sleeping mats are the industry standard and they're very quick to deploy. If you want an ultra light cot, there's these generic cots that you can get off of Amazon, but they do require a lot of setup. But they're also very comfortable, so they might be worth the setup. Moving up to all season wood stove compatible tents. My current winter tent of choice is the Nortent TP tent. They are very easy to set up and they are very resistant to all weather conditions and they are compatible with a wood stove. The current wood stove I use is the Winterwell Titanium Wood Stove. In terms of lighting, have a good stockpile of candles. They are very cheap and they have the added benefit of providing small amounts of heat. Now in terms of flashlights, you're far more likely to need a lantern in an emergency situation than a tactical flashlight, but of course it's good to have both. Companies like Olight, Throughnight, Immolent, and Nightcore all make high quality flashlights. Just make sure whatever flashlight you get has a rechargeable lithium ion battery and that you have a small solar panel to recharge it. In terms of off-grid electricity generation, there are portable options like the Lightsaver Max from Powerfilm. 
There are medium-sized solar generators like the Energy Apex system. And of course, there are larger combustible fuel generators, which put out more power, but they are noisy and they do run on a finite fuel source. Good luck finding gasoline after a disaster. The great thing about solar is it's indefinite. The only limitation is that the upper limit for power output is still much better for gasoline generators. However, the modest power needs of an emergency situation can typically be met by one of these smaller scale generators like the EcoFlow Delta, the Titan Generator, or like I said, the Energy Apex. The other downside to these is that they cost a lot more than combustible fuel generators. For first aid, Adventure Medical Kits make fairly comprehensive starter kits. These are relatively inexpensive and you can customize them to suit your needs. A product called the Bug Out Roll is also an excellent way to manage your first aid supplies. It has large transparent windows, is built very durable, and can be quickly deployed in an instant when seconds matter most. One thing a lot of these kits don't come with is a blood clotting agent. I would recommend the SAM Medical Bleeding Control Kit as a hemostat. Pandemic supplies like antiviral face masks or plain N99 masks could prove very useful in a disaster predicament. There are numerous other medical supplies like skin staplers, tourniquets like this one from the SAM company, braces and splints, and antimicrobial or antibiotic ointments which would greatly enhance the capabilities of your kit. For cordage, Titan survivor cord, braided fishing line, even Kevlar cords might be worth researching. For navigation, a Brunton compass, an SOL signal mirror, and an emergency whistle are all essentials for micro preparedness. In terms of cookware, for a highly fuel efficient fuel source which is going to have a long stable shelf life, propane is the way to go. Pair that with a decent propane stove and you'll be good to go for extended periods of time. This propane will also double as fuel for heating. The Mr. Heater system is one of the safest, most reliable, and most well-known propane space heaters on the market today. I would strongly recommend them. If you're bugging out into the wilderness, there's two main options. There's your forever fuel stoves like the Firebox stove, which is a flat folding stove which is very efficient at burning natural materials. Or if you want something which is far more efficient but runs on a limited fuel supply, look into the isobutane powered stoves like the MSR wind burner or the jet boil. Pair these with titanium cookware for a bug out situation or cast iron cookware for a bug in situation and you'll be good to go. In terms of fire, I would strongly recommend any of the products which come from the Pro Camp Tech company like fat rope, the fire strip roll, fire plugs or the waxwood stick. Pair that with a magnesium fire strike or ferrocerium rod and you'll have no problems lighting fires even in inclement weather. The luggable loo is basically a toilet seat on a bucket. If the grid goes down and the water pressure stops, you're going to be SOL and this is going to be absolutely essential. Pair that with some porta potty chemicals and you're good to go. And in terms of personal hygiene, when you're on the go and you gotta go, you can't go wrong with good old toilet paper tablets. In terms of wood harvesting tools, the Haltafor's axe line is great. Gerber also makes high quality axes, although some people prefer the Haltafor style axes because if the handle ever breaks, you can replace it. Not that I've ever personally seen a Gerber handle break. In terms of saws, which are probably most essential for wood harvesting, my personal favorites are the Silky Zubat 390, the Katana Boy 650, and the Silky Curved XL240. In terms of knives, there are so many high quality knives out there, I'm gonna leave that one up to you to decide. Whether it's Mora, K-Bar, SOG, Cold Steel, Benchmade, or even Survival Lily's Apple One Survival Knife, all of these will do the job that you need it to do to varying degrees. That's really only skimming the surface of survival gear. I recommend that you watch my survival gear playlist if you want to get up to speed on some of the most cutting edge survival gear that's out there today. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com. Your one-stop shop for premium, high-quality, brand-name products that have been tried and tested by myself and other YouTube gear reviewers. My subscribers save 10% off by using the coupon code SURVIVALPREPPER. All one word in all caps. Have a Merry Christmas. Enjoy the time you have with your family, but stay ready.